Welcome to VaderBox. I'm Bambi Francisco, and with me, as always, is Ezra Roizen, our VaderBox regular digital media investment banker. And once again, we have Marissa Meyer. She is VP of Search Products and User Experience at Google. And Marissa, thank you so much for joining us once again. And this time, we're going to look at Search Me. So this is right up your alley. Um, this is the company that started in 2005 with initial funding from Sequoia, and in the last two years, or I guess three years, it's raised a total of about $43 million in funding. So this company has a lot, a lot um, of cash. Um, not sure if they're burning through it all. Has but had a lot of cash. Had a lot of cash. So, so, <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look at, uh, Let's take a look at this pitch. How you doing? I'm John Holland from SearchMe. And if you think about uh, search, there hasn't been a lot of innovation in search in the last 10 years. Basically, enter a query into a field, click search, and you view a list of text results. And SearchMe is innovating in the field of search with visual search. So instead of seeing a list of text results, you actually see the pages that you're searching for. When users enter their queries, they actually get some suggestions based on our understanding of their intent of the query, and they can refine their query, and then they can actually see the pages. We also have included web, images, and video into our search, and we allow users not only to find stuff, but organize and share things in stacks on the web. Okay. I'll Pretty kick pithy. it off. I'm sure we have an expert <laughs> here who's going to have more to say. I, my, my issue, I mean, at the end of the day, this is a product question company. I mean, it does this product work for the dogs and dog food. Do people come and use it in large quantities? My problem is that you want more of a first approximation when you search for a general category. So if you do football on this search page, you, you, all you're getting are pages one after the other. And you haven't necessarily gotten to a place where you've, you've drilled down to what specifically you want. I'm already looking at content without having gone through a pretty big scan of the content, getting closer to the thing that I want to have. So football right. it could be soccer. It could be American gridiron. It could be swollen foot. It could be lots of things. And if I'm already deep into content looking and it's sort of drilled down experience, I may or may not be getting things that are relevant. So first off, I think that's a very tricky problem in UI. They're bringing a deep content experience to a, a scanning type model, which I don't know, I'm sure you have many more thoughts on that. Sure. Well, I definitely agree that search needs to innovate. We're just getting started in search, right. and it's on a long runway in terms of different things that we can try. And I think it's great that search means trying a lot of new things. Mm -hmm. That said, I think it's also important to understand the cognitive model for search. Mm -hmm. Are people in a mode right now where they're browsing through lots of different results? Do they want to go deep? And it's hard, actually. We've seen that thumbnails in some situations really help, and sometimes they actually aren't helpful. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when you're looking through your history, when you've already seen the pages, thumbnails are super helpful. Because you might say, mm -hmm. oh, gosh, I'm looking at that page I saw yesterday, and I remember yeah. it was kind of purple, and there was you know, a picture on the right-hand side. So in that kind of situation, thumbnails and sort of page-level rep representations are helpful. Right. But if you've never seen the page before, it's just not that helpful. Mm -hmm. All you can really see is, oh, there's a lot of pictures, or, oh, there's a lot of text. Yeah. And what you really want are the pieces of information from that page that would be helpful for you to make an assessment. Mm -hmm. Do I want to click on it or not? Do I want to see the whole page or not? Right. You want that surfaced up. So generating a snippet, be it visual or you know, having it really just drill down to the particular fact you're looking for, that element of the description is what you're really trying to capture from the result. And thumbnails yeah. aren't always the best if you haven't seen the page before. Yeah, I mean, I think I recall this company, Browster. Do you remember Browster? Mm -hmm. And even I, maybe Ask also did it. With, and I don't know what it, it's called, but it's, it's a view where they, you show you see the thumbnail when you scroll over the, the search result. And that never really worked out. I mean, nobody really used it. And maybe you're right because they don't really care to see the page. They just care to see the context. I, I think there's, sorry. Oh, isn't it? If the thumbnails are big enough that you can actually read them, mm -hmm. they're useful. Yeah. Right? But the problem is if it really just is a small representation, yeah. we've noticed that on things like desktop search, right. browser history, on Google Chrome, right? We've done some experiments right. there where we've tried to understand what okay. does the page look like. Like, if, for example, when you open up Google Chrome and you see your nine most mm -hmm. visited pages on the new tab page, right. it's really easy, really easy to spot. That's my email account. That's my corporate email account. You can pick those pages out because you're really familiar with them. Okay. But if you're learning about a whole new topic, Seeing a picture of the web page, especially when you can't read it, doesn't help. Well, but the picture, we but the picture of the web page, the picture, just one last thing, the picture of the web page tells you the, the type of content it is. Right, yeah. It doesn't tell you what the actual content is right. on that page. This right. is a news page, this is a blog page, this is a forum page, this is a this page. That's all you know. You don't know yeah. if it relates to soccer or football or gridiron. You just know that it's a news page. Well, let, let's talk well, about then what, what this company can do. I mean, what do you think as a business, it should, how can this be applied to something? This, to me, when I look at it, it looks like a lean back type of environment. Yeah. So you sort of, 
Well, I think what's interesting there is it's clear there's some people who really like looking at the user experience and design elements and trying to think of how that relates to search. And so I think they need to keep pushing on those pieces. Okay. But I think understanding how people cognitively look at search helps, right? For example, we think a lot at Google about information density. It's interesting because people, when they think about our design, think a lot about minimalism and sparsity. Yeah. And that's partially it, but partially it, you want to convey as much information as you can pixel by pixel. So mm -hmm. you just take a few lines and try and convey as much as you can. What's frustrating about things like thumbnails is it takes up a lot of space, but all you've learned that it is that it's a blog, mm -hmm. which they could have said in one word rather mm -hmm. than in a big picture. And so right. I think they should take the energy they have towards that user experience and really think about information density, how do people like to find things, and really put, put that energy and into And where is the UI relevant to the problem? So maybe, yeah. for example, mm -hmm. if they're going to do like fashion design search, that makes a lot of sense. Makes it's sense. a very exactly. large visual problem. If they're right. going to do image search, they're going to do things which are inherently visual, yes. and where you already declared generally the category you're in yeah. when you start the experience. I think that's a good implementation for something where you're flipping through. It's a magazine type model. I think that when I'm going in and doing first level search of generally something I want, yeah. I want data. So I sort of scan through a lot of data quickly. What I understand from Mark Kwame's quote I, I read somewhere yeah. that from Sequoia Capital said that this is a much better way to address uh, branded display advertising on search pages. Right. So do you think that there's a way to, I mean, I guess what we're saying that, first of all, you need to pe have people using it before yes. you can even think about advertising. But for some reason, he thinks that this is, this is a way to bring branded advertising into uh, the search process. Uh, Possibly, it's, it's hard to say. I think that the thing that would lead to that type of conclusion is that they do work based on categories. And it's often easier to get brand advertisements associated with categories than it is to get those brand advertisements associated with something as targeted as a keyword. So maybe that's possible, but that said, then the categories, you know, they, they lose an element in some cases of relevance to what the user's looking for. And so mm -hmm. that level of abstraction, which makes it easier to put brand advertisements in, often it ends up being not as useful in terms of the actual end user search results. Right. I, I would also say that, first off, why would you want to put brand advertising in the search? I mean, search is the one place, and Google's proven exactly. it, where you have act now advertising. It's the only place click through actually matters. Why would you take a brand impression and use McDonald's when you could use, like, click here to get what you actually want specifically? And so I think that that taking the CPC out of search, which is yeah. the beauty of search. If you have a search-based business, you actually get users doing searches, yeah. and you're throwing up banner ads, yeah. you have completely train wrecked the business model you originally set out to create. Absolutely. I mean, we've said a lot. You know, the business Google's yeah. in is delivering well-targeted leads. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So, so it's like $43 yeah. million dollars of making a bid yeah. on that. Some, you know, the point is, like, if somebody just typed golf clubs, why yeah. wouldn't you serve them an ad for golf clubs? Mm -hmm. yeah. Why would you abstract that to the category of sports and right. serve an ad for a random brand yes. that's associated with sports? That doesn't make any sense. So Sell them golf clubs. Sell them golf clubs. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 yeah. they, they yeah. launched their mobile app. Yeah. Is this a good UI for a mobile application, for mobile searching? Mm -hmm. I, I haven't taken a, a look at it in depth yet. I think okay. that the um, search experience on a phone is always really different. How much can people type? I think that their suggestions will play in their favor there because yeah. by allowing the users to end up refining yeah. so and, and really you know, saving you some of the typing, I think that will ultimately help. Mm -hmm. I think that, again, going back to that information density, if results take up more space without conveying a lot of information, that's not great because space is even a more precious commodity on the mobile phone. I, right. think you're, I think, first off, I do think there's something here. I think there's a way to take this and apply it to categories of implementations. I think broad-based stuff is not the best plan. I think taking a screen that's already scrunched on a, on a regular screen and scrunching it further <laughs> down <laughs> to an iPhone does not enhance fundamentally the experience. So I think what you want to do is scrunch down to words, and I think most of the things that work on mobile are text. They're not images. It's, it's text. Okay. But I do like the iPhone, you know, use of imagery. I, I, the, the UI with, with images. Which is funny and, because I think there's sort of this that. DNA thing, I'm sure, okay. with them, which is like iPhone, you can swish things yeah. around. Search me, you can swish things around. They're both kind of cool. They it should go together. Like, but the yeah. reality is you got to really get the implementation right. Okay. Let's jump into the liquid scenarios minute. And this is the time yeah. we look at uh, valuations and exit strategies for this company. Um, this company that raised nearly $44 million with, um, with Sequoia Capital participating in each of SearchMe's five rounds since the company's inception. 
Both Search Beast founder Randy Adams, who led the design team for Adobe's Acrobat, and Chairman Mark Kwame, a partner with Sequoia, invested personally in SearchMe's recent round of financing. This speaks highly of their belief in the venture. SearchMe already has one million uniques going to its site with longer average stays. The iPhone version became available November 19th, and Liquid Scenarios estimates this could grow to over one million users by Christmas. It's possible that growth in search means mobile audience could drive users to its desktop version. Moreover, since mobile and video search are the higher growth, higher margin segments today, the company could command a higher premium for each user and could potentially be at a run rate of 50 to 75 million within the next 12 to 18 months. At that rate, the most strategic bit might be with its development partner, partner Adobe. Assuming Adobe's price multiples return to normal, a stock deal to acquire SearchMe for half a billion dollars would result in just over 2% dilution, uh, but potentially return five times that in appreciation within three years. Under that scenario, each of SearchMe's existing investors would also receive return multiples consistent with venture fund targets. That's the liquid scenarios minute. Now, of course, they're suggesting that they've got a pretty high hurdle. After raising $41 million, uh, $44 million, then you know, I'm sure that's what the investors are looking for, and, but can they do it, and how do they do it? That's the upside scenario. I think that in many cases, if I were I this company, and Sequoia's, you know, obviously lots of successful companies, very smart guys. Randy Adams, very smart guy as well. Um, so they probably have lots of great insights for how to get there. Were it me and I had to take over tomorrow, I would do fewer things and find categories where the, where the implementation worked really well and then try to find people to drive traffic to those categories where it worked well. I think it's really early and hard to tell. I think they're experimenting a lot. It's not clear what direction the product will go in and there's conflicting signals. If you look at their user growth, it's starting to hit that exponential curve and they've mm -hmm. really had a big pickup this fall. But it's really early and we have to see will that continue, right? Is, are they really responding to users? It's interesting, I think that a lot of times people will say, well, gosh, the, the search industry is so big. Mm -hmm. And, you know, valuations get really big when they get close to search. But sure. one reason they get really big is because the advertisements are, in fact, so targeted mm -hmm. and so measurable. So I think one of the hurdles for Search Me is if they're going more into the category and brand-based ads where things become slightly less targeted and slightly less measurable, mm -hmm. that could actually be a challenge, and it takes them away from those higher valuation search it, search valuations that you sometimes see. Oh, great points, both of you. Thank you, Marissa, and thank you, Ezra. And Marissa, you're going to stick around for two more Vader boxes, so, <laughs> so stick around and you'll have to stay tuned for uh, those segments. You've been watching Vader Box on Bambi Francisco. We'll see you next time on Vader TV.